All right, we're ready to get started here. Welcome everyone. This is uh, Caprice Murray calling. This is Caprice Murray from Tensoft, and um, uh, today's webcast is going to be about services and contract accounting. We've got our guest presenter Jeffrey Werner of Werner Consulting Group here today. And uh, as soon as we um, get finished with some introductory remarks, um, he's going to be uh, presenting on the topic. We'll be, um, uh, let's move to the next uh, slide. We'll be sending out uh, handouts to everyone um, before the end of the session. Um, so um, look for that in your email box. Um, I will send you a PDF of the uh, slides. Um, and um, just uh, to let you know, you can submit questions at any time in the uh, questions box over to your right. Um, anything you think of, just uh, go ahead and submit it, and Jeffrey will answer it uh, at regular intervals um, when he pauses for breath, and uh, we're running a polling question. Also, uh, the CPAE certificates, they will be emailed to everyone who is eligible by the end of business this Friday. And eligibility, of course, is attending the entire meeting, answering all of the polling questions. Uh, so very important that you do answer those polling questions when they come up. And then afterwards, if you have questions that uh, didn't get answered during the webcast, just occur to you afterwards, and uh, you really would like to get an answer, here are some emails. You can, you can shoot us an email. Jeffrey is very gracious about um, sending out uh, answers to folks. And uh, we will try to compile these um, in a blog that will be available on our website afterwards. So uh, go ahead, next slide there, Jeffrey. Uh, we, um, we are going to have a, a few words here from uh, Tensoft's founder and CEO, Bob Scarborough, who's going to um, tell us a little bit about Tensoft. Uh, we're hosting the session today. And uh, Bob, go ahead and turn it over to you. Bob, be sure to uh, unmute your uh, mic there. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the tip. That, that, that's perfect. So, okay. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, and, and welcome to Jeffrey's session. And I, I know it's going to be a good one on, 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 on a great topic related to revenue recognition. Just a couple things about us, and then we'll get to Jeffrey, that we are, for folks not familiar with us, we are a business solutions provider. And specifically, we do revenue and billing management solutions for technology companies. Now, we have two made products. One of them is the contract billing management for people that have lots of moving parts related to billing and customer execution. And we have a revenue recognition management, which has the ability to do fair value and, and rev deferred revenue management and, and really a lot of the value add around uh, revenue recognition for, for um, uh, related to multi-element arrangements or, or and it will support the ASC 606 requirements as well. So next slide, please. A little bit of a flow for you in terms of that, and, and I think it's sort of how we think about transaction flow related to um, uh, moving things that, you know, in a more systematic way, sort of moving away from spreadsheets or moving away from uh, other types of systems to something that's a more automated flow. And so it really goes left to right, where the left-hand side where it says website or CRM, RCM contract, ERP document, we're really, the, the first goal is to capture the sale. And, and you know, the sale that the conceptual very simple, but uh, sometimes it can be simple to complex. And we want to identify how you sell and onboard it efficiently. And so the sales transaction comes in, and we want to onboard it. And then there's the when we get to the revenue engine, we want to take that sales transaction and format it automatically. So we can do a fair value allocation. We can do some workflow if that's required. We can assign rules to it. So. You know, capture the right sale, onboard it efficiently, format that per, per transaction, and now you have a sub-ledger where um, your life becomes compute post report. And, and really, the goal is to simplify the day-to-day -day transactions by having a more rules-based approach. And, to, and by that, I mean system rules, not necessarily accounting rules, although they can line up and so on. But uh, anyway, that's the general flow to have a revenue subledger and revenue recognition. So next slide, please. 
So just a few bullet points here about the revenue recognition is the compute post report process and, and by report, you know, a whole world of possibilities become available to you uh, once you have things in a system and out of a spreadsheet where you can have different measures, uh, different user defined fields, you can look at new versus renewal customers, what, whatever sort of additional metrics you want to capture in addition to your revenue, the ability to forecast your revenue, the, the ability to see the impact of change on your revenue. You know, it's really, there's a whole world of possibilities that become open up to you and, and, and if you can simplify your revenue recognition structure by taking the knowledge in your company and putting it into a system and then having sort of an automated, consistent way to recognize your revenue. So that's, that's really it. So, so please move on and, and let's uh, introduce Jeffrey here. So I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Jeffrey Werner today for the webinar. Jeffrey is an acknowledged expert in the area of software revenue recognition. He's been providing revenue recognition consulting services to software and high-tech companies since 2001. And so prior to launching his consulting business, Jeffrey was a CFO for Amtron Design Systems, a mixed signal synthesis company based here in Silicon Valley. And before that, he was VP of Finance at Telepost, a web-based communication services company based in Santa Cruz. And early in his career, Jeffrey spent 11 years with KPMG Silicon Valley office where he was a senior manager. Jeffrey regularly teaches uh, software revenue recognition classes in the San Francisco Bay Area, including some that he teaches through us. And, and I think they're the, the most economical. I mean, it's really a bargain the way he teaches the classes in terms of the value received and, and, and the way he does that. He has over 15 years of experience helping companies comply with revenue recognition regulations through policies and best practices. So I'm pleased to introduce Jeffrey. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Bob. And um, just want to emphasize some of the things that um, Caprice mentioned in the uh, introduction. We will be uh, taking questions during the course of the webcast and try to answer them uh, as we go through or uh, at the end. Also, uh, we'll, if there are a number of those questions, um, both during the webcast and after the webcast, we'll consolidate those in a blog with the uh, answers on the Tinsoft uh, website in the, uh, what do you call that section, the, the useful things section? With, with, uh, the, but but there's, a, there's a, the resources section, which is where we keep the archives of these uh, webcasts, and we will be recording and uh, posting the archives there. Uh, one thing that we, uh, that I noted uh, getting the slides ready for today is, is we're not going to be able to fully cover the topic, um, so we might consider doing a part two, and if you're interested in that at the end of the, the webcast, you might uh, let us know. Um, and with that, let's uh, move on and take a look at our agenda. So what we'll be looking at today is uh, the various types of services contracts that uh, technology companies enter into, so time and materials type uh, contracts uh, where we work on an hourly or a daily sort of rate, uh, fixed fee contracts, uh, where we've got a set fee for a uh, given project or deliverable, how we account for that. We look at um, bundled services with either products and or software. Uh, we'll briefly look at the milestone method, funded R&D, and talk about lost contracts. So it's a lot of, uh, of items on the agenda. One thing I wanted to mention is, I, as Bob uh, stated there, I do present uh, technology classes on revenue recognition uh, and we've got one coming up in May. It's a, it's a seven-hour, uh, two-part uh, webcast. It's a paper attendance, and it's May 12th and 14th. Um, there'll be more information and registration uh, details available uh, soon. What I cover in that class is the general principles of revenue recognition, multiple element revenue recognition, BSOE, software revenue recognition, an expanded version of this uh, services and contract accounting. This is a, the presentation today is a subset of that uh, that class. That's the first day. The second day we, we do a review. We catch up if we didn't finish the services and contract uh, accounting. We talk about the relative selling price method or the, the EITF 08-1 uh, methodology for non-software companies. It's been uh, the current methodology the last five or six years talk about SaaS and cloud computing, and then talk about the uh, FASB IASB new revenue standards. So that's uh, 
two half-day class that we uh, will be presenting in uh, May. Um, but to our, our agenda today, these are the things that uh, we'll be uh, talking about. And uh, we'll have a polling question come up shortly, but I want to get into the, the uh, content here and make sure that everyone who's attending has had a chance to log in and uh, get going. So while we're talking about services and contract accounting today, we still have to keep in perspective that the, the four general principles of revenue recognition still apply and need to be met in order for us to uh, recognize revenue. One thing that we focus on in our discussion today is, is the second and third uh, bullets, which is, has delivery occurred? So or when does delivery occur? If we do services over a period of time, it's taking place over a period of time. Also, um, the fees, uh, whether they're fixed and determinable, and we spend some time talking about how we allocate those fees, particularly if we're in a, a multiple element arrangement. But again, we do need to have all four of the uh, criteria, the general principles of revenue recognition met in order for us to recognize revenue. So we have to have persuasive evidence of an arrangement. We have to have a contract between the vendor and the customer. The vendor needs to have performed or delivered uh, the service or products or whatever is the uh, subject of the agreement. The fee needs to be fixed and determinable so we know how much revenue it is that we'll be recognizing. And then finally, the uh, fees need to be collectible uh, in order for us to recognize revenue. Those, of course, are the four general principles of revenue recognition, and they do apply. When we look at the services contracts uh, that we're going to be talking about today, we really fall into you know, four general categories. So time and materials contracts, uh, you see this typically for services that are sold on an hourly or daily uh, basis with uh, expenses or materials. I think in the technology uh, world, we typically see those more as time and expense, but people still refer to them as time and materials um, from more of a less virtual uh, business model in the past. Then there's fixed fee arrangements where we have a set of fee for a variable amount of effort in order to provide a deliverable uh, or some sort of project or service uh, to a customer. Then multiple element arrangements where we have either fixed or time and materials type services contracts with other elements. And finally, in the software world, if we have services that are essential to the functionality of a, of a software product, then we have to look at those typically as, as one element rather than uh, multiple elements because they really don't function independently. Let's take a look at the, the services uh, contracts. But before we do that, maybe we could do our first polling question. And you're going to be able to do that from the tab over there? Are we gonna, okay. So uh, as part of getting CPE credit, uh, you need to be logged in for the entire webcast. And then to monitor participation, we ask polling questions in order to uh, document for our uh, ability to give uh, CPE credit. So the first question is, how much of impact is the new revenue standard likely to have on your company? No impact little impact, fair amount of impact, substantial impact. The question is not applicable to me, or I guess we could have a, a, a sixth one there. What new standard? <laughs> so that's the, the new revenue standard from the IASB and the uh, FASB that changes how revenue recognition will be going forward. And I guess it's a good question sort of prompts me to say that what we're discussing today is current US gap for revenue recognition on services. and that will, of course, be changing in 2017, 2018, depending on when the, uh, the promulgating bodies decide it's going to be effective and whether you're a public or uh, a private uh, company. We got our, our polls are open, and we're looking at uh, with a fair amount of impact. Is that the, the one that's getting most of the uh, criteria? And if we got that and substantial, which was is, is what you'd expect because it is a, a rather uh, all-encompassing new standard. And we got the polls finished voting so we can move on. So with time and materials type contracts, 
generally you'd have a, a scope of work, a statement of work, which would form your evidence of an arrangement. Uh, it would state it's on a time and material basis, that you know it's got estimates, but those aren't guarantees. Some kind of provision in the contract for additional days. If the addition, initial estimated days are exceeded, you might have an ex expiration date, particularly for prepaid um, time and materials contracts. It's, it's a good idea to do that so that you can uh, wrap it up and close it out and recognize the revenue if a lot of time goes by and the customer doesn't, doesn't use all of the uh, services that they've, they've contracted for. Generally, you'd want to, if you do have expiration dates, have some sort of provision for extensions and ad ad additional fees. It's really important in the time and materials contract that the vendor contractual relationship with the customer be one that for each incremental day or hour, whatever it is that's worked, they're going to charge for them so that it's not uh, a fixed fee arrangement. Because if you set limits, it won't exceed something, uh, then you're probably going to be looking at uh, fixed fee sort of arrangements, which has a very different uh, method of accounting for uh, the, the revenue. So fixed fee arrangements, again, you're going to have some sort of statement of work or SAL, that was the abbreviation that, that we use. Generally, fixed fee arrangements are non-standard. While there are some, I guess, bundled or packaged services that you might have like a quick start program for a a product or a service that includes uh, a set number of days. Those are typically more of a just a package of time and materials type services. But a fixed fee arrangement is going to be non-standard in that the fee is fixed for a specific deliverable that's a unique project to uh, the customer, and either it's a deliverable or a, 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 a suite of services that are provided over time where the fee is is set and the effort that the vendor would be expending could be variable to achieve that fee. And if they do it for a lower amount of, of effort or a higher amount of effort, the fee is still set. So the fee is not based on, on effort. And if you're in a software arrangement or a multiple element arrangement, then you're going to be need, you're going to need to be able to value those uh, those fixed fees, and we'll, we'll talk about that a, a little bit later. If you're doing a license, um, the license and the service might be considered um, one element and then would have to be recognized uh, in one of our contract methods, either the percentage of completion, the completed contract, or the zero margin method. And we're going to talk in detail about those methodologies. Other issues that we need to consider when we're Providing services in our contracts is acceptance provisions. If we do have provisions for acceptance by the customer, then generally our revenue is going to be deferred until acceptance. And if that acceptance is at the end of the project, then we may not be recognizing any revenue until uh, the project's completed and the services uh, are, are accepted uh, by the customer. Again, if we've got multiple element arrangements, that's going to be uh, provide us with some complexity depending on whether they're software arrangements or uh, product or non-software type services or uh, other elements. So let's let's uh, look at a, a time and materials type of contract, and we'll look at both time and materials and fixed fees, where those are they are a single element in the arrangement, and therefore it's it's pretty easy to uh, understand the accounting. And then to the extent we've got time, we'll look at, at least in a general way, how we deal with time and materials or fixed fee services when they're part of uh, larger arrangements with multiple elements or bundled with other items. Really, for time and materials services, it's a pretty simple and straightforward revenue recognition methodology. If you're billing on a daily rate, you would recognize the revenue for each day as the services are provided as long as there's no acceptance or other uh, uh, contractual terms that would conflict with our four general principles of revenue recognition, then um, it's really just a matter of recognizing the revenue as the services are provided and or uh, a build to the customer. 
Let's take a look at an example of, of one such arrangement here. We've got a single element, time and materials contract, and we have a statement of work, and a, there was a purchase order that was dated in uh, October, and it's for 10 days of senior consultant time at uh, $2,000 per day, so it's a $20,000 uh, engagement. Uh, the standard price or the VSOE of a senior consultant in this case happens to be $1,800 to $2,200, so the, the fee per day is within our normal range. That would impact us potentially in, um, in bundled arrangements, which is what this uh, example comes from and, and, and is utilized uh, in the more complete course when we look at in detail uh, bundled arrangements. And then at the, at the end of December, uh, six days have been completed, so we need to recognize the revenue for those six days. And we do that by just um, multiplying the six days that we've worked times $2,000. We're going to bill and recognize $12,000 at the end of the accounting period in December. And then we've got four days that um, we did not complete out of the 10 days in the contract. And the $8,000 for them, if it has been billed, would be in deferred revenue. If we hadn't billed that, we would um, include it in our backlog and recognize it as those remaining days are completed. One thing we want to emphasize is if the project now, it turns out it's going to take 11 or 12 days, we would need to amend the contract to a change order with the customer in order to um, have a contractual relationship for those additional one or two days. If we were not going to charge for those one or two days, we'd really probably have a fixed fee arrangement rather than a, uh, a time and materials type arrangement. And as we'll see, when we look at the fixed fee uh, accounting, there's a very different methodology for accounting for the fixed fee arrangements. But for a, a straightforward time and materials type arrangement, we just recognize as we bill or as, as, the, as we, we accrue for the days that we've worked, bill the customer, recognize the revenue. It's, uh, it's fairly straightforward when the engagement is a single element arrangement just for those time and uh, material uh, services for the team and services. When we have a fixed fee arrangement, um, again, as we mentioned, they're typically non-standard. We're going to have one fee for a specific deliverable. It's not going to change uh, based on the effort that we expend, which is the nature of the time and materials type contracts that we were just looking at. And so we're going to have to come up with another methodology in order to uh, do the accounting because we can't just bill it for each day that we, we work we have to look at that effort that we're expending in the context of the entire arrangement. When we have fees, fixed fee type arrangement, the fee obviously, as it says, is fixed. So it's, it's based on a result or a deliverable, not on the effort that's expended to uh, deliver that result or deliverable to the customer. And the methodologies that we have to recognize the revenue uh, come from construction type accounting, the old SOP 81-1 uh, uh, construction accounting or contract accounting. And the three methods that are in that literature now in the 605 uh, of the ASC are the percentage of completion methodology, the completed contract method, and the zero margin method. So we'll take a look at these three methods uh, when we use which one, what we need in order to use it, and how the results differ depending on the methodology that we, that we use. So the percentage of completion contract is a method where we take the number of days that we work, or number of hours, and divide that by the total number of days that we're going to, or hours that we're going to work on the project. There are other input methods that, that companies use if you're doing a project that has costs, um, material costs that are significant, you might want to do a cost-to-cost -cost, uh, 
percentage of completion calculation where you would look at what's the total labor cost and the total materials costs involved in the project uh, and put the cost to date over those to get the percentage that you are completed at any one uh, point in time. In order to use the percentage of completion method, uh, the company, the vendor needs to be able to make reasonable and dependable estimates of the effort that's going to take to complete the project. Typically in technology we companies, we see that as time, uh, consultant time, effort, but as I mentioned, we could use other metrics like the, um, the cost, if there were material cost and labor costs that, that we would use. In addition, you need to be able to make these reasonable dependable estimates and you have to have some experience, a history of performance on similar projects where your estimates were dependable, so you're, that your actual results were consistent with your estimates at the beginning of the project, such that it's reasonable to say that you can use the, the percentage of completion method because the uh, denominator that you are using is a uh, reliable number. Typically, you're going to have low technology risk because it's going to be something that you know you can do, you've done in the past, and you have the ability to estimate and know exactly what you're going to be doing. In our examples, we're going to use consultant days as a, as a metric to determine the uh, percentage that's, that's complete. So we take the estimated total number of days and put that in the uh, denominator. At any one point in time, we take a look at what the completed number of days are and put that in the numerator, and we come up with a percentage that tells us how much of the revenue that we're going to get for the project to recognize. So I think we're ready for a second polling question um, to monitor our uh, attendance today. And again, if you've got a question on uh, what we've presented so far or something that you'd like to see presented, uh, why don't you pop that into the question and we will uh, try to answer that. So our second polling question is, what does the uh, what method of adoption of the new standard does your company uh, plan to follow? Retrospective, simplified transaction, transition method, uh, have not decided or haven't thought about it yet. So some of our questions have been more related to the, the new standard, which I hope you're uh, aware of. And so the polling is open, and you can take a look at that. And is this a question that came in? I think it's just someone just looking for the slides. Audio seems to cut out between the slides. OK, I don't know. I'll try and pause when I, I change the slide so you don't miss any of the uh, commentary. Thank you for that comment. Sorry that that's, that's happening. Not really sure why. Ready to close the polls or still some votes coming in? OK. So let's take a look at a, a uh, fixed fee arrangement that we're going to account for under the percentage of completion uh, method. Again, this is a single element arrangement. Here we have a statement of work or a SAO that's uh, entered into in October between the vendor and the customer. It's a fixed fee of $100,000. The vendor is reasonably able to uh, make an estimate of the time that it's going to take to complete the project. There have been similar projects completed in the past. And the estimate is that it's going to take 50 days to complete the, the project. At the end of December, 30 days have been completed. So we take the 30 days that we've completed. We divide that by the 50 days, which is the estimate of the uh, total days to complete the project. And we determine that we're 60% complete. We would multiply that completion percentage of 60% times the fixed fee for the arrangement for the $100,000, and we would be able to recognize $60,000 of consulting revenue in um, the period uh, into December 31st. And I got the wrong date in there, so, <laughs> so I'm getting confused about the year. Um, and then the, the remaining 40%, would be deferred if the whole fee had been invoiced or be in backlog um, uh, if it had not been uh, yet billed. 
and would be recognized as that is performed in the next uh, accounting period or, or periods. But as you see, the determination of how much of the fixed fee revenue to recognize is based on the number of, of days that we completed divided by the total estimate of the days uh, required to complete and then multiplying that percentage uh, by our fee. Now one thing we should mention here is that if your estimate is going to it changes during the course of the engagement and my experience is typically the, the estimate usually increases rather than decrease then you would need to recalculate what the revenue would be and do a catch up uh, or a catch down I guess you would say uh, of the revenue that you'd recognize such that if it, if you had uh, 30 days completed and you realized that it was going to take uh, 60 days instead of 30 then you'd need to um, redo your calculation in the next accounting period and limit the revenue uh, to the percentage that you could um, complete. This of course is the reason why it's very important for the company to be able to do reasonable and dependable estimates at the outset of the arrangement in order to utilize the percentage of completion method because if you aren't able to make uh, reasonable and dependable estimates you would inevitably result in incorrect revenue uh, during the course of the of the engagement and you know might have to if it was material restate your financials or or, or do adjustments such that um, the percentage of completion really wouldn't be uh, an appropriate way to recognize the revenue. Now the, the good thing about the percentage of completion method is if it's appropriately applied it reflects the economics of the transaction in all the accounting periods. So uh, in this case we've got a you know margin of uh, if we if we had the same cost per day of two thousand dollars or rather if we had a cost of a thousand dollars a day um, we'd have a fifty percent margin in, e in each period and we'd have expenses and revenue in each period so the financials would be a good representation of the activity of the company and of course that's a, a goal of accounting is to reflect what's what's taking place uh, in the marketplace if a company doesn't have the ability to make reasonable and dependable estimates or their prior estimates and actuals have been widely divergent, then the, the next methodology that uh, we would use would be the completed contract method. And the completed contract method we use when we are unable to make reasonable and dependable estimates of the effort to complete a project. So we can't really get that uh, denominator correct. And that might be because maybe we haven't done this particular type of service or project in the past so we don't have experience uh, on which to rely or it may be that we don't have uh, a very good estimating process such that our estimates are uh, more like guesstimates and the actuals have diverged significantly from them. Could be because it's high technology risk. We haven't done this before like sending a person to the moon or you know, right, doing a uh, from scratch new product, there might be significant technology risks that we don't know how long it will take. When we find ourselves in this kind of situation, we're, the percentage of completion method will not be available to us, so we can't uh, apply that. What we'll need to do is do the completed contract method. And to apply the completed contract method to a fixed fee contract, what we do is we capitalize or defer the cost as we incur them and then we recognize all the costs and all the revenue when the project is complete. And to contrast with the percentage of completion method, this isn't as good a representation of the economic uh, activity of the company because in the initial periods until the contract is completed there would be no expenses recorded in the uh, statement of operations or the income statement and no revenue. So that's not exactly a good representation of what's taking place. But if we wouldn't be getting the revenue right because we don't have the ability to make good estimates, then this is going to be the best method uh, that we can use because one of the goals of revenue recognition methodology and uh, guidance 
is to get the revenue right because it's such an important component of a company's financial statements that we don't want to have incorrect revenue in the uh, in the financial statements. It would be it's been determined, at least under U.S. GAAP, it's better to um, defer the revenue and wait until the exact revenue and profit is known than to uh, do something that might be inaccurate. So under the completed contract method, we're going to wait until the end of the project when everything is done to recognize the revenue and then all those costs that we've uh, deferred or capitalized during the uh, project period will recognize and then all of our revenue, all of our costs, and all of our mar margin occur in the period when the, uh, the services are complete and therefore the name the completed contract method. So let's take a look at an example of how that would work. Here we have a similar uh, arrangement to our other one. It's a single element arrangement. There's a statement of work and there's a, uh, a purchase order and the, the fee that we're going to receive is $100,000. But as we mentioned, we're unable to uh, estimate the time that it's going to take to complete the contract. Um, we do know in this case that the cost of a consultant is $1,000 a day. So we know how much we need to defer in each period for the number of days that have been worked and then we'll be able to uh, capture the costs and defer them until the contract's complete and recognize all the costs when we recognize the revenue at the uh, culmination of the project. So at December 31st in this case, we've worked 30 days similar to what we, we did in the percentage of completion example, but we will recognize no revenue for the work that we've completed for those 30 days. And the $30,000, which is the 30 days at $1,000 a day, those costs will be deferred. We'll put them on the balance sheet as an asset of uh, deferred cost or work in process, um, some other uh, description for that, uh, that current asset of the company. And then in the initial period, we'd have zero revenue and zero uh, cost of revenue in our, our financial statement. So you can see that this it doesn't reflect the activity of the company during that period, but it does uh, most accurately reflect uh, the revenue and the profit that the company will be recognizing. Then when we work additional days in uh, the subsequent period, uh, in, in March, we work the additional 20 days, we have those costs that we've incurred in that period, and we would do our total accounting at the end of the period when all of the effort that was required to complete this contract is completed, and we then we'll recognize the revenue and the expenses. So we recognize the, the entire fixed fee of $100,000. That revenue will be recognized. The $50,000 of cost of services will be recognized. That was the $30,000 that we deferred at the end of December and the additional $20,000 that we uh, incurred in the, uh, the first calendar quarter. And therefore, um, we'd recognize all the costs all the revenue and have all the margin. That, of course, was the uh, completed contract method. Now, there's a third methodology that a lot of uh, people don't utilize very often, uh, but is available to us and is sort of a, a mix between the two, uh, a hybrid of the percentage of completion and the completed contract method. And this is a method that we use similar to the completed contract method when we're unable to make a reasonable or dependable estimate of the effort that it's going to take to uh, complete the project. Similarly to the completed project method, maybe we don't have a history of similar projects. Maybe there's high technology risk. But the difference here is there's a high level of confidence that the project will be profitable at the end of the day. And of course, this begs the question, well, if you don't know how much time it's going to take and you haven't done it before, how can you have this high level of confidence that the project will be uh, profitable? And I guess there's two answers to that. One is that you could be in a very high margin business and it's just a case that you don't know 
how much profit you will be making um, on this uh, this fixed fee arrangement, or where I see this more uh, frequently is when a fixed fee project is a component of a larger deal, particularly if you're uh, got a high margin of business like software with fixed fee services, then the zero margin method might be a better representation of the uh, economic efforts of the vendor and uh, would be a way to, to utilize, uh, would be a good, good methodology to utilize to account for that transaction. So when we apply the zero margin method, we recognize revenue equal to the costs as they're incurred. So in each period, we take whatever the cost that we've incurred, we recognize revenue to that amount. And since the revenue and the costs equal, there's no margin or profit in the earlier periods. Then at the end of the project, we'd recognize all the margin, which was the, the variable that we had that we didn't know. Uh, in that case, at that point in time, all the costs are known, the fee is known at the outset of the arrangement, and we can uh, recognize all of the remaining revenue and margin at the uh, completion of the project. Might be time for another polling question now. As we're moving on towards the uh, hour and haven't seen any questions um, so far. Someone said that, I see that someone thought that the sound was fine, so maybe that resolved itself, that's good. Um, our third polling question is, do you currently, how do you currently manage revenue recognition at your company? Uh, commercial revenue recognition software application such as Tensoft, in-house developed revenue recognition software application, Excel spreadsheets, ERP accounting system that actually does the revenue for you, or questions not applicable to me. I guess maybe some companies don't have revenue. Or they just they just invoices is revenue, so there's not really a, a revenue management uh, exercise, although I think that's kind of uh, rare these days. So the poll is open, and we're getting some, and it looks like uh, Excel is in the lead coming around the post, and I'm going to bet they're the winner <laughs> when the polls are closed, because that really is um, uh, the, the, the situation. And I think part of that is because, uh, you know, in the past, uh, everybody has Excel. A lot of folks haven't put the time and effort into evaluate the revenue management of programs like Tinsoft that are now available and that can do a lot of remarkable things um, to recognize uh, revenue and to manage your, your, your revenue process. Okay, so the polls are closed. Let's, let's take a look at an example where we apply the uh, zero margin method. And again, it's our same arrangement that we had for the completed contract um, method and for the percentage of completion method. This is where we have a single element arrangement. We've got a statement of work. The fixed fee is $100,000. Um, we don't have the ability to estimate with precision the uh, time that it's going to take to complete the project. Our cost per day is $1,000. And in this case, we're going to apply the zero margin method because we know the contract will be profitable at the end. So the real question is, how much profit would we recognize in each period? We don't have a good way to do that because our, we can't estimate. But the zero margin method, since it does have revenue and cost in each period, is a somewhat better reflection of the economic activity of the company than the completed contract method because, as we saw in our, our previous example, the company recognized zero revenue in that period ending December. And here we'll recognize some revenue uh, along with uh, the cost that we've been incurred. So at the end of December, when we've completed our 30 days, as we did in the, the prior two examples, and the we know that our cost per day is $1,000 a day. We've recognized $30,000 in revenue, $30,000 in costs. Our uh, margin would be zero, so we'd have the zero margin, which is where we get the name of the, the process or the, the methodology that we're applying. Um, then uh, 
at the end of the project, when we worked the remaining 20 days, we'd recognize the full $70,000 uh, remaining on the fee in our uh, additional cost for those, such that when we look at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the project, we will have recognized $100,000 in revenue and the $15,000 in costs, similar to what we did for the completed contract method and the, and the percentage of completion, but we'd have different um, results in the, the uh, interim period before uh, completion. So I don't think we have a slide where we compare them, but if you just think back, in the first example with the percentage of completion method, we had um, $60,000 uh, in revenue that we recognized and, uh, and the cost uh, uh, as incurred, which would have been $30,000 if we had the same uh, $1,000 per day cost. In the second example that we looked at when we were doing the uh, completed contract method in the period in December, we had zero revenue and zero cost and we'd uh, deferred or capitalized thirty thousand dollars in costs, and then um, under the uh, completed contract method, we have we recognized thirty thousand dollars in revenue and costs in the uh, period into de December, and then the full uh, profit of fifty thousand dollars in uh, the final period when we recognize the remaining revenue and the remaining costs. So three different methods for accounting for a $100,000 fixed fee arrangement and three very different results from the uh, uh, from the methods that we used. And we have a question that says, just to confirm when the zero margin method, the revenue cannot exceed the cost and vice versa until the contract is fully completed. That would be true. So you, you, you recognize revenue equal to whatever your costs are, and um, therefore it's called the zero margin method. So in our example, in the interim period, we had $30,000 worth of costs. We recognized revenue equal to them of $30,000, and we had zero profit or zero margin in that period. So it's a good question. A lot of uh, people are either unaware or don't make use of the zero margin method. I think sometimes that's because if you know you're going to be profitable, it's probably because you have the ability to do good estimates and you're using the percentage of completion method. But in particular, I've seen zero margin method on uh, large engagements where there are multiple elements and some of the elements are very profitable, but the total cost on, on maybe one element that's a fixed fee uh, is unknown or is not known with precision, so the zero margin method can be applied. And again, the, you know, the benefits of the, the three methods are the percentage of completion. You've got a good representation of the economic activity of the company, but it does require um, the ability to make uh, dependable estimates. The completed contract method, you get the total revenue and total uh, cost correct. It's just in the final uh, period. And then the zero margin sort of blends those two where you have a representation of some of the effort in the initial periods and all the profit in the in the final period. What we've been talking about uh, up until now is single element arrangements where the accounting gets more difficult and unfortunately it takes a quite a bit of time to go through that and explain and show some examples of uh, how to deal with services in multiple element arrangements. So we did, we're not going to have time to do that today, but we'll, we'll talk about the, um, the methodology of how we do those. So if you've got a service uh, arrangement, either a time and material uh, type of services arrangement or a fixed fee arrangement, and it is bundled with other services and products, you would need to take a look and see whether your, those other products and services that it's bundled with are software that's covered by software revenue recognition rules, or if they were tangible products or other services that aren't related to software. Um, 
then you'd recognize those under the, the relative selling price method. So there's really two methodologies for uh, recognizing the multiple element arrangements. I guess it's easy to say if it's software, you're going to follow the residual method, and we'll talk about that briefly. If it's not software, if it's products and other services, you're going to follow the relative uh, selling price method. So what are those methods? Well, for the products and other services that aren't software that, that are going to follow the relative selling price method, there's a four-step process. The first thing that you would do is separate out the individual elements of the arrangement. And those need to be independent elements. They need to have what we call standalone value. They have to typically be sold separately is one way to determine a standalone value. But if you've got you know, three things, you've got a product and you've got a warranty with that product and then you've got some services that you're selling with it, you, you would most likely come up with three uh, separate elements for that arrangement. Then you'd need to determine the value of each one of the elements in that arrangement. Use those values to allocate the revenue to the various elements and then recognize those elements as you uh, deliver them. I went the wrong way there. When you're determining the value of each element in the relative selling price method, there's three methodologies that you can use. You can use VSOE, which is the vendor-specific objective evidence methodology that comes from the software revenue recognition world. That's an analysis of what you sell each element for when you sell them separately. And you need uh, data, historical transactions, in order to do that analysis. Or you can use third-party evidence, which is uh, basically competitive pricing. If, a, if another vendor has a sufficiently similar product or service, you could um, use that, that price that, that uh, the marketplace determines. Uh, Lacking either VSOE or, or TPE, you need to come up with an estimated selling price. Also, some people call it best estimated selling price, so BESP or ESP. And there's lots of different methods um, for doing that. That's a whole module that um, we present in the, uh, in the full day class that we do, uh, that we break up into two uh, half-day webcasts. So you'd use, you determine the, the value of each element, get the percentage that each uh, element has of the total transaction fee and then recognize that percentage as those items are, uh, or elements are delivered or fulfilled. The software revenue recognition methodology differs significantly. You still got a, a four-step process, but it's different. You're similar to the, the uh, relative selling price method, you're going to separate out the individual elements. So what if you got a software license, support and maintenance, and some services? You've got uh, three different um, elements. Then you look at what is the value of, based on VSOE of the undelivered elements in the arrangement, and you're going to defer the full value of those undelivered elements. And then you subtract that from the total fee and determine the residual value of the delivered elements and recognize the residual value for the delivered elements. As you deliver the undelivered elements, you'd recognize them at their VSOE. Very different methodologies, very different results. Typically, the software uh, residual method results in uh, deferral of more revenue than the relative selling price method, and that is because all of the discount is applied to the delivered elements, and none of the discount inherent in the arrangement is applied to the undelivered elements, where in the relative selling price method, the inherent discount in the arrangement is applied radically to all of the elements in the arrangement. It looks like there's one or two more questions that came in. Um, let's see, looks like the zero margin question got answered. And when we uh, sign up, when can we sign up for the two-day class? And I'm not sure when we're going to have that available. But we, just, we will be sending out an email to uh, the mailing list, which you're on if you attended this, this class. So I don't know exactly when we'll uh, uh, make that available. But in the next, in the next couple of weeks, and if you, you don't see something in your inbox, you could uh, 
uh, send out an email to me or to, to Caprice at Tinsoft, and we will uh, we'll get you registered for that uh, class. So we're coming up on the end of the uh, the webcast, but I wanted to talk about oh uh, you know more on the residual method to determine the VSOE. You'd have to have an analysis of standalone transactions and what you sold those undelivered elements for. Now, one of the good things about the residual method is you only have to come up with values for the undelivered elements because then you subtract that from the total fee and whatever's left over goes to the uh, delivered elements. But determination of VSOE can be somewhat burdensome. You have to have a sufficient history of transactions in order to analyze. There's a pretty rigorous process associated with that and some best practices. Um, and in the absence of VSOE, if you're in the software residual method, you're going to end up with delayed revenue or, or, or ratable revenue. Uh, and if you've got uh, multiple elements, you, you, you might end up with the, the contract uh, methods that we talked about, the completed contract, the percentage of completion of the zero margin method, applied to the whole arrangement uh, as if it were one element. So it's and you know the application of both of these methodologies is um, can be very complex, and that's why you know it takes a, a day for us or two half days to do a, a class that gives you a, a good solid introduction uh, to those. Now there's a couple other uh, aspects of contract accounting that we want to make sure we cover in the last few minutes here. One is if you're if you're applying one of these contract accounting methods like the zero margin or the percentage of completion or the completed contract method, and at any point in time you realize that the contract will uh, result in a loss uh, for the company, then you need to accrue that loss and recognize it in your financial statements as soon as you uh, figure out what it was. So if we had our $100,000 fixed fee arrangement and we determined that it was going to end up costing us $110,000, we were going to suffer a $10,000 loss, we would need to um, expense that $10,000 loss as soon as we realized it. And then we continue to monitor the, the, the loss uh, that we anticipate. And if additional losses, we determine there's going to be additional losses, we'd accrue for those. If we determine that, no, we overestimated it, and we're going to leave that loss on the books until we complete uh, the contract. Did we do our fourth polling question? We got that. You, you just popped that up there without me knowing it. Does your plan to research revenue recognition software, or do you? Does your company plan to research revenue recognition software applications in the next two years? Yes, no, maybe. Uh, don't know. Or questions not applicable. So, are you looking to move? those of you who are on Excel to some more robust and um, comprehensive sort of revenue recognition uh, application in the next couple of, couple of years. And I guess maybe if your company doesn't, but if you'd like to, you could vote <laughs> You could vote yes on that as well if you're a revenue recognition uh, professional and um, find that uh, as beautiful as Excel is, it has its limitations. Um, you'd like some of the robust reporting or some of the automation so you don't have to do one, each one individually in a revenue recognition uh, management, software management um, might be a good thing for you. We got the polls closed on that and that's our, that was our final question. Hope you don't just leave us till we, we finish up here. Talk about two other things with contract accounting. One's the milestone method. People talk about that a lot, but really the milestone method is got to be consistent with performance, so it's typically consistent with your percentage of completion or your proportional performance uh, methodology where you're going to recognize often the lesser of the milestone amount or how much you've completed. Um, typically, those milestones have acceptances, so you can't recognize revenue until the acceptance occurs. And oftentimes, the milestones don't uh, correspond with the effort to uh, perform on the contract. Particularly, you'll see that when there's a payment, a milestone payment at the onset of the arrangement for signing, when the company has done nothing to fulfill the contract, you couldn't really recognize uh, any revenue for that uh, upfront payment just because it was a milestone. Of course, milestone method's much more complicated than that, but that's the basics. And the other one I wanted, thing I wanted to talk about was 
funded R&D arrangements because those aren't revenue contracts. Those are contra expense contracts. So if you've got an arrangement where a company is receiving funding from a third party and there's no deliverable to that third party, then maybe you don't have a revenue contract. Maybe you've got a funded R&D contract and you're going to recognize a reduction of your expenses for the fees that you receive from the funding party rather than revenue. It's, um, it's different than purchasing technology before it's available. And the key here is that no deliverable is made to the funding party. Oftentimes you'll see a company fund another company to develop an app for their product or some complementary product because they believe that if that uh, is available, it will uh, increase sales of their product. But the funding party doesn't actually take uh, a deliverable from the uh, company doing the research and development. That, of course, is different if, um, than, if, than if it's a new release. So if there's no deliverable, there's no, there's no revenue. It's probably a reduction of expenses in your R&D uh, category on your financial statements. If, however, the customer is prepaying and does take delivery at a future date, then you probably have revenue. It's just you would defer the revenue until uh, you release the product that they're funding the development of. So that's some nuances on uh, revenue contracts that sometimes are, are missed. And then there's the surprise, well, there's really no revenue from that contract because it wasn't structured such that you have a deliverable. Well, we're, we're out of time. We've uh, spent a, an hour talking about contract and services accounting. I hope you found it uh, beneficial today. Let's see if there's, a, there's another question here. It says, do you plan to distribute the slides? Yes, those will go out. We talked about the May class will be coming up. There'll be more information about that. Um, here's what we covered, time and materials, contracts, fixed fees, what we do when we've got bundled arrangements, the milestone method, funded R&D, and lost contracts. So all touched on today, not in depth, but hopefully you found some benefit. And if there's one of these that interests you, you can do more research on it or perhaps come to our uh, our class in May, or if there's enough interest, we might do a part two on this, where we look more at the um, multiple element or bundle uh, arrangements. If you've got questions, you're welcome to email me, WernerJ at sbcglobal.net or Caprice at Tensoft. Thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you found it beneficial.